Good. If you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand, and these kind gentlemen will give you one. Um, and uh, this morning, we welcome you. If you are clicking on our website to watch this by video, you can also download the notes that the congregation has um, on our actual website where the sermons are found and uh, be able to follow along as we study as an in-depth congregation of, of Christ followers. We want to look carefully at God's Word. Well, in recent days, as we have studied the book of Hosea, we've been looking at this scandalous message of God's love. We call it a scandalous love because it is such an extreme look at how God is faithful even when we are not faithful to Him. In fact, I believe that many of you have been challenged to look at the depth of God's love in these last four Sundays as we've looked at chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. The first three chapters of Hosea have this odd image of the prophet and his family. As God commanded Hosea to marry a promiscuous woman, and his whole life and his marriage would be an illustration to the nation of Israel of his God's relationship to them. This promiscuous wife would not be faithful to Hosea. She would go out and go out and go out. And then eventually, as we saw in Hosea chapter 3, that Hosea would even go and buy her back from a slave block, from a slave block because of her extreme unfaithfulness. And we see, of course, that this is the very image of God's great love for us, God's great grace to us. And um, so this morning, I do want you to notice that as we come to Hosea in chapter 4 and 5, um, we see that this is launching into the body of the book of Hosea. And the body of the book of Hosea has quite a bit of the recognition of Israel's sin. From the get-go, we see the illustration from chapter 1, 2, and 3, we see this extreme illustration of God's love. Even though they don't love Him, He loves them, and He does so in the most extreme and scandalous way. But here is our opportunity to also see the extreme nature of Israel's sin against a holy God. Now, when we come to verse, chapter 4 and 5, and really the rest of the book up to um, chapter 13, we see quite an outline of sin. We see quite an outline of God's wrath upon them. And this morning, I've entitled the message, Why Study Scripture Passages on Sin and Wrath? Why should we do that? Now, that's a good question for us because we're going to do that um, a little bit. This, the, all of the messages will not be centered on that, but that's largely what a lot of what Hosea is about. In fact, I just want to say to you that this is part one of a message um, this morning. We're not going to look at the whole thing. We'd be here till three or four o'clock this afternoon, so we're not going to do that. Um, but we are going to notice something that's very, very important um, for Sheridan Hills in this day and time. Notice the title question. This is the, uh, the statement at the top of your page. The title question is this. While the book of Hosea has some astounding statements of, underline it, God's love and forgiveness. Underline those, God's love and forgiveness. We've talked about his scandalous love. We've talked about his faithfulness and his forgiveness to us even amidst our unfaithfulness. While we have those astounding statements, the majority of Hosea is revealing sin and declaring God's wrath against it. In fact, like a lot of the Bible, if you open through much of the Old Testament, you will easily come to a place where the issue of sin is being dealt with. And for those of you who have been around for a little while, we've talked about the grand narrative of Scripture that is, that is really summed up in four main words. And what are those four main words? In Genesis 1 and 2, we see creation. That was very weak. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see creation. Okay, if you're new to us, you're getting that. Okay, wow, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created, right. In Genesis 1 and 2, is creation. Genesis 3 is the fall. 
And then we see through the rest of the Bible, the grand focus is not just the fall of man into sin, but God's redeeming work. His redeeming work, a holy God redeeming people out of the fall into what he will restore in what? In glory. So it's God's grand plan that we're going to move through this process in all of human history to God's grand plan to finally everything being set right, everything being brought back by his grace, his power, and his mercy to a place of total restoration um, as it was in the beginning. So, but in order to get there, We must deal with this issue of redemption, and redemption has to do with dealing with our sin. Our holy God is a holy God that requires that our sin be dealt with. He does not wink it away. He does not imagine it away. He doesn't just say poof and it's gone. He would be an unjust God if he did that. And the whole story of the the gospel, the whole story of God's plan of redemption brings us to that. So, the question is this. So, is it really necessary, bottom of that paragraph, so is it really necessary to study the sin-wrath stuff? If so, if it's necessary to study that, why? You say, well, there's so many churches, Pastor, that are here in South Florida and that are really all around America and even around the world that they just simply aren't going to really talk about that. In fact, we know that there are some pulpits that are very, very popular. They, they have television broadcasts. They have internet reviews that are incredible. And, and they really don't ever talk about sin, that sin is simply not an issue to them People just need encouragement. People just need encouragement and, and being lifted up, having their sights raised up out of the difficulties of this present life. And there's this picture of not desiring to deal with about three quarters of the Bible. We like to go and pick and choose some of the passages out of Isaiah that are so encouraging, some of the aspects of the story of Genesis and Exodus where God comes and rescues his people, but we don't want to look and see their idolatry. We don't want to look and see their immorality. Listen to this. We don't want to look and see their ungodliness and his wrath pouring out upon that. And so when we start to pick and choose what passages and what themes we want to take in Scripture, we begin to have a very distorted gospel. A very distorted gospel. A gospel that isn't true. In fact, on Wednesday nights, we're studying about the counterfeit nature of many gospels that are preached, that they're simply not looking at the Word of God as a whole and the whole of Scripture, and so key issues are being left out, and they often have to do with the great depravity and the great sinfulness of our hearts for which God would come and die. And so we we love to talk about forgiveness, but we don't really want to talk about what needs to be forgiven. We love to talk about grace, but we really don't want to look and look at the issue of repentance. And so very often, we, we would like, you know, we said it before, God loves to forgive, and I love to what? Sin, and so me and God have a good deal. There are so many people that have that attitude, and I want to say to you that that is not the true gospel of the Bible. And so we come to this issue, why in the world would it be necessary, why in the world should we not run away from the passages in the Bible that deal with sin and the passages in the Bible that deal with with the wrath of God against our sin. Why should we do that? Number one is because every last word, fill that in, because every last word of God's holy word is eternally important. We do not have the authority or the option of picking and choosing what we are going to look at in God's truth. We are called to look at all of it. 
We are called to listen to all of it. We are called to read all of it. We are called to come to know all of it. We are called to come and look at the whole picture, not just the portions that we like. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, and let's read it out loud together. It's on your page that is right in front of you. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. Let's read. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Just to underline the last half of that. The word of our God stands forever. There are only two things that make it off of this planet. And number one is the word of God. It lasts forever. And number two is the souls of people. Those are the only two things that are going to leave here. And so God's word is going to survive, and the souls of people are going to survive, and that is it. Everything else is going to be consumed. So the grass withers, the flower fades, just like the rest of creation, but the word of God will stand forever. We need to study all of it. Look at the next part. We see this in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is about to start his preaching before he goes to the cross over a three-year period. And before he starts his earthly ministry, he goes and he fasts for 40 days. He spends time with his heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. And there he is in the wilderness. And as he is there, it says he became hungry. Now, I think After 40 days, you would become hungry. The picture is you miss a couple hours, you get a little hungry, and then that goes away, and then you go a day or two, and you get pretty strong, and then it goes away, and then you go through a few bouts with hunger after that. You can go for two weeks, two and a half weeks, and have almost no hunger, and then at the end of that, for those who have participated in a 40-day fast, at the end of that 40-day fast, your body starts to say, If you don't give me something, I'm going to die. And hunger comes back extremely strong right at the end. And so Jesus is at that place. Jesus is is there communing with the Father, denying the flesh, and embracing his mission that God has given him to do. And as the second person of the Trinity who was present at creation in the fulfillment of the grand plan of the Godhead, Jesus is beginning his ministry. And it says here, during that wilderness experience, look at verse 3, and the tempter, that's Satan, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become what? Loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, right out there to the side, Deuteronomy 8. So Jesus goes, just D-E-U-T, 8. Jesus goes to the Old Testament, and Jesus goes to the words of the Old Testament, and he quotes back to Satan the very word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Underline those two words, every word. You see, circle the word every. You see, we are called to live by all of God's words. We are called to live in accordance with all of his statutes and his commands and his statements and his doctrines by which we have been given the word through the word. So we need to recognize that Jesus, in a double whammy New Testament event, because Jesus is temptation, but he is quoting from the Old Testament And so we're seeing Old Testament and New Testament come together through the words of Christ, and he's saying all of it is important. We see this again in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, very familiar passage of Scripture. Look what it says in verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 17, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Here is Paul writing to a young pastor named Timothy, and he's telling Timothy, Timothy, all of God's word is what your message is. 
It is all of God's word by which people will be saved from their sin. It's all of his word which will correct their life and show them the truth of God and come and train them in godliness, train them in being like God. And so, if you would, circle the word all and underline the word scripture. It is all scripture that is breathed out by God. So we don't pick and choose Look at Matthew chapter 8, 28, verses 19 and 20. Again, a very familiar passage of Scripture, and it's interesting to me in these very um, popular passages of Scripture that we see this same theme. Look in verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe what? Circle the word all underline the rest of that, that teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You see, Jesus didn't intend for us to just say, okay, just tell everybody that a Savior died for their sins, and if they believe in him and turn away from their sins, that, that they can be saved from their sins. He rose again, and, and that's, they just need to hear the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is that God would come and die for their sins. You receive that by faith. You turn away from uh, sin in this life. That's really all you need to know. False. That is an incomplete gospel. Even if you jotted down the four or the five or the seven key points that you want to make about presenting the plan of salvation, if that's all you tell then you are missing out on the grand picture and the grand narrative of what God has. So God's people should not have an aversion to his work in the past in bringing about the, the plan of salvation. We should see that this helps us see God's great goodness. There's Psalm 19, Job 23, Psalm 33, Psalm 119, and 22 verse 19 that all show this picture that all of God's Word is important. In fact, in Revelation at the end of the Bible, we are warned, do not remove words from this. Anyone who removes words from this the plagues that are described here in condemning, and in, in the great picture here is the great condemnation of God will be upon them. So God is very serious about his word, and he's saying, and we should not remove those words by simply avoiding them. Well, that's not popular. People won't like that. People won't come to church if they see and if they hear certain aspects of this. No, my friends, listen, Christians have nothing to fear concerning the glorious word of God. We run to his word because it's here that we find out who he is and what he has done and the great depth of all that he has done that we may know him and love him and rejoice in him. Now, on February, excuse me, on Friday, December 10th, 2010, Friday, December 10th, 2010, in Paris, France, I had taken some guys to the airport, Charles de Gaulle Airport, Marcy and I were there for a meeting. We used to be missionaries, for those of you who are new to us. And I had come back in the morning, um, just after running them around the corner to the airport. I came back a few minutes later, and I pull back into the parking lot, and I pull up to the door to get another load of guys to take them. And there's my daughter, Cheryl Ann, 13 years old, standing there at the door of the hotel. And she runs up to the car, and she said, Dad, come quick, something's wrong with Mom. So we ran upstairs, we get to our hotel room, and there is Marcy writhing and moving around in the bed uh, with people looking on. Marcy was in the midst of something very wrong with her. And the paramedics were on the way. In just a few seconds, the paramedics arrived. They had their big striker stretcher that was there. They had all their tackle boxes and their toolboxes. And they come, and they start setting everything up. And they're listening to her. And she's describing the pain. It's in my arm. It's in my neck. It's in my back. It's in my head. And it's very intense. It feels whatever. And they're going, okay, madam, madam, it's okay, it's okay. You're just having stress. You're just stressed out. So whatever has happened, you're just having a little bit of a panic attack. You're having a stress attack. And so 
Um, she is there writhing in pain. She said, you know, I've been under stress before, but it's nothing like this. And as we, he, one of the paramedics looked at me and he said, does she ever do this before? And I said, no, this has never happened before. And he said, well, this is stress. And so they said, we'll take her to the hospital, but this is stress. It's going to calm down. So we go to the hospital. We get there, and there's no doctor. There's no cardiologist. There's nobody, anybody, anywhere around. We waited 10 or 15 minutes, and I gathered her up in my arms, and I went to leave to go find a taxi. I go out of the building, and there is my colleague who had gotten in the car to go get the girls, and he said, I, I couldn't leave. I was just impressed to stay. And in fact, he had, he had gotten back out of the car and walked back into the building, and there I was with Marcy. And we carried her to the car, we laid her down in the back seat of the car, and we drove across Paris to another hospital that we knew had cardiologists. All of that time, we were being told, ah, relax, you'll feel better, it's just stress. Now, friends, that brings me to number two. The reason that we should study sin and the wrath of God is because of this. A superficial diagnosis or all superficial diagnoses lead to false remedies. When you don't have a proper diagnosis, you won't have a proper remedy. And so if you don't really see and understand the seriousness of sin and the holiness of God and the wrath of God, you are not going to approach sin properly. This is part of the reason that the nation of Israel needed Hosea's message. This is part of the reason that we need to see all of the message of God's word that is warning us about our sinfulness and God's holiness and his wrath against our sin. It is only only when we start to see the true diagnosis of the human heart broken and apart from God can we begin to see the need for such a radical remedy as Jesus dying on the cross, the creator of the universe coming to die in our place. You see, all of the, notice this here with me, positive thinking, secular psycho, psychoanalysts, uh, psychoanalysis, prosperity gospel, popular culture, none of these things. They simply do not have, fill it in, the true solutions. They don't have the true solutions that are needed in this life. In fact, they don't even know the true problem. You see, if we, if we simply say, well, we like to imagine God to be, you know, just a a very big cosmic positive energy and a positive force. We like to think of God as just being omnibenevolent. We don't like to think of him as holy. We don't like to think of him as a holy judge. We we really would prefer an image of God that is more grandfatherly, more innocuous, more tame. It was C.S. Lewis who would write, in the imagery of Aslan, that Aslan is good, but he is not safe. And here we see that the true message of the gospel is a God who is good, but he is not safe. The only way that we are safe with God is that when we see our sin problem through his eyes and that we deal with his analysis of our hearts. The world is not interested in that without the Holy Spirit convicting them. I also know of another um, superficial diagnosis. I mean, I, I want you to imagine if you develop a melanoma on your hand or on your back or somewhere on your leg or something like that. We, Marcy and I met a woman yesterday who um, she said, I'm a cancer survivor. As we were talking about that, we said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, we fish a lot. We're out in the sun a lot. And I came in from um, one time uh, doing something, and I just noticed a black dot on my leg. And as she noticed the black dot on her leg, she, she didn't think much of it, but something said, it doesn't look normal. And in fact, so she called the dermatologist. She went to see the dermatologist, and um, they took a biopsy of it. She went back to hear the results of the biopsy, and the doctor looked at her and said, um, It is melanoma, it is growing, 
and we're going to remove it today. And she said, what? And he said, yes, it needs to be done right now. It was a very serious moment. She said, uh, okay. She called her boss. She called her husband. She called the people around her, and she said, apparently they're doing this right now. And she had surgery to remove it. Now, you see, the diagnosis is very grave, and so the response is very radical. There are some things that are simply deadly, and one of those things that is deadly is not being right with a holy God. And so a radical response, such as the creator of the universe coming and dying on the cross in our place, is necessary. You see, the source of all of our, fill this in, the source of all of our sickness, our sorrow, our pain, our death, is found in our sinful state. It's because of sin that we have these agonies. It is because of sin. And you say, you mean because of a particular sin that I did? Well, it could be because of a particular sin, but we look at this as the grand general picture of our fallen nature before God that is brought pain and suffering and hardship and sadness into the world. We should rightly view these things. False remedies can lead to the two things, either slow or subtle or sudden and surprising calamity. You see, a false remedy can lead to a slow and subtle creep away from the things that are true or to a sudden and surprising calamity. The people who are told, you're good with God, don't worry about it, you're good, you're a good man, you've been a good little business owner, you've been generous to the people around you, you took care of your mom and dad, you have nothing, you're, yes, you've got cancer and you're gonna die, but you've been a good boy. So don't worry about it, God is gonna look at you and it's gonna be fine. So there is this sudden and surprising calamity when he dies and hears the words, depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, look at all the things that I did, look what I gave to. I even had teenagers in my house I mean, my goodness, I mean, this is, you know, we, we start accounting all of our works of righteousness instead of looking at the cross of Christ. You see, see, if you're told that it's by your works by which you can be saved, it may be a slow, slow and subtle change that pulls you away from the gospel or a sudden and surprising calamity. Look at number three. Why else should we study sin and wrath? Because understanding sin and wrath, this is so, so positive. Understanding sin and wrath will make you wiser. This will cause you to be wiser. And they put out there to the side, and there are blessings with wisdom. There are great blessings in wisdom. But we have to know the truth. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, just for a little bit of fun, we went to Disney World. Disney World does not believe that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Most of the mantra that comes out of Disney and the rest of our modern culture is just follow your heart. Just follow your heart. Just do what you think is right in your heart. Your heart will never lie to you. That is false. Read Jeremiah 79. We need the one who can fix a depraved heart. We need the one who can come and recalibrate a heart that has become corrupted. Somebody says, well, pastor, I just don't appreciate you saying that my heart is corrupted. Well, I'm not saying it. God said it. God has said that you need to let him give you a new heart. God has said that, you, that he is the one who comes and reveals your need for him. Look at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to counsel. All of the counsel of God's word is what we so desperately need. Do you have your Bible? Turn with me over to Psalm 19. It's right in the middle of your Bible. If you open to Psalms, or if you open the Bible in the middle and go to Psalm 19, not 119, but go to Psalm 19. I want you to see this. 
and this is not on the screen, and it's just going to be in your Bible. I want you to notice Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. Just a few verses here. Similar to Psalm 119 is a list that describes the Bible. Different words that describe the words of God. So the word law is there, testimony, precepts, commandment. Um, all of these are, are showing the words of the Lord or the result of his word in our life. Look at Psalm 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. You see, it's good. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Look what it says. Doing what? Rejoicing the heart. Look at verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. You, if, you, if you fear the Lord, you, you, you have nothing to fear in eternity. Here's the picture. It endures forever. Look at the next part, middle of verse 9. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now look at verse 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Look at verse 11. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And so there's this picture that when we are in God's Word and in all of God's Word, not avoiding God's Word, that we are made wiser. Look at the bottom statement that is here. God's Word on sin is what reveals the folly, the folly of our fallen world in sinful hearts. Before, below the word folly, write the foolishness. Because you see, sin is, is what results in us being fools, results in our foolishness. But it is the Word of God that reveals our need for Him. Flip your page and look at number four. Why else do we study sin and wrath passages? Why should we not run away from them? Why should we not think, oh no? Listen, here are two more reasons that I think are very encouraging to you. Number four, because understanding sin and wrath will warn you of great danger. Understanding sin and wrath will warn you of great danger. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Um, chapter 1, 2, and 3 of Romans deals with this issue of sin and wrath. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness, underline it, suppress the truth. Underline that part. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now friends, when a preacher handpicks only encouraging verses out of the Bible and never calls sin, sin, and never calls you to the standard of God, he is suppressing the truth. And he is suppressing the truth in such a way that can lead you astray and destroy you. Moralistic, therapeutic deism, which means be good religion, moralistic, therapeutic deism will take you to hell. Biblical theism, that means studying what the Bible actually says, will save your soul from yourself and from sin. Amen. Now, this is just the beauty of the warning of God. God has written it down for us. He's described how our hearts are prone to run away from him. He has described how we are prone to worship other things besides him. He has described in vivid detail what Israel kept going back to. And so we can look and we can see their folly. We can look and see where they went wrong. And we're going to study next week in, Romans, or in Hosea 4 and 5, we're going to see how their priests stopped preaching the truth of all of the Scripture and the law of God. The people did not know the law of God, so they went out and they did all of these other things. Their prophets were false prophets, and so they did not preach to the people a call back to God. And because of all of that, 
the nation of Israel went merrily after other gods. And God, in his love, rebuked them and chastised them and condemned them to a punishment that ultimately would bring them back to him. Notice here in Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 1 really is what it is, is this grand juxtaposition between the children of God and the people who are not the children of God, the great righteousness of Christ and the picture of those who are not in Christ, those who are not in God. They're not under the forgiveness of God. So here's the picture of Christ versus a fallen world. And all of those who would follow Christ with Christ are the righteous. And all of those who are outside of Christ are the wicked that have never come into the righteousness that God gives through his sacrifice. Look, notice here with me in verse 1. Blessed is the man, and here comes three verses that describe the sinful and the wicked, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, so this, this man does not walk with them, but the unrighteous man does, nor stands in the way of sinners, the unrighteous man does stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats with the scoffers, the unrighteous man does seat, sit with the scoffers. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You see, the righteous are going to remember the words of God. Verse 3, here's the blessing. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That's, that's the beautiful blessing of of knowing God through Christ, walking in his truth, knowing the truth. Verse 4, underline it, the wicked are not so. So they're not going to be blessed. But they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. They're a part of the wheat that just carries away with the wind and is remembered no more. Verse 5, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Here's the big difference. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will what? Perish. Underline that. Will perish. And so that little arrow just points out there. You can write out there somewhere, destruction. That is what happens. You see, God's word will warn you of going the way of the world without his grace and forgiveness in Christ and without his standard of joy and holiness. It is a righteous and good thing that God calls us to, not a suppression of the truth. Psalm 119 is all about this in the beautiful picture of how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is the beautiful picture that God has called us to. Finally, I want you to see this. We study sin and wrath because of number five also. Because understanding sin and wrath will help you cherish the gospel. This is important. This will help you cherish this go the gospel. It will help you just have a great value and exalt God's plan of salvation. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. In verse 1 it says, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. We've got to pay closer attention. We can't be lackadaisical about it. We can't pick and choose. Look at verse 1. Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we what? Drift away. That's a big problem. A lot of Hebrews, the whole book is about don't drift away from God. Don't drift away. Find yourself squarely in the grace of Christ. Find yourself squarely in the superior nature of Christ's salvation and not your own because your own is no salvation of all. He says, lest we drift away from it. Verse 2, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and you see there, there were angels saying, the Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming, this one is going to come, goes to Mary, you're going to be pregnant with a baby, goes to Joseph, you, this, this is going to happen, goes to 
person after person after person throughout the Old Testament saying, a Messiah is coming. It was declared, and now he's here. He's born in Jerusalem, born unto you this day in the city of David is Christ the Lord. The Messiah has arrived. So we see this here. Verse 2, for since the message declared by angels proved reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect what? such a great salvation. You see, friends, the salvation of the gospel in Christ is a glorious, so great a salvation. We want to see all that Christ has done in forgiving us from our sins. And if we don't know what sin is, if we don't see the great wrath of God that is going to be unleashed against sin, we will not appreciate what Christ has done for us. It's seen like this. I want you to notice Colossians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the word of, of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, on one hand, it's a joke. It's, look at you. We go to the beach on Sunday. You go sit in a big box with people, you know, what in the world? I mean, you see, it's a joke when they think about living a life that is not for the here and now, but for the hereafter. That is folly. The picture of the cross is folly. But look what it says. But to those, but to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. What created the world? The power of God. What redeems our lives? The power of God. What promises eternal life? He is the resurrection and the life. This is the one. And so just kind of notice this diagram that is here. And, and it, it, it's the, your life and the progression of time. And in the progression of time, there you are, little tiny dot in that, and you're running, this little, running through this life, and there's eternal life that is on the upward path of the call of Christ Jesus, and there is eternal destruction on the path of rejection of him. And somewhere along the way, you come to a fork in the road, and there is the Christ. Now, I'm, I'm going to just say for the sake of this illustration, for Christians, you come to salvation in Christ. You're saved in Him. And you've, you've come, you've heard the message of the gospel, you've heard that a Savior has died, and that you, that you would come to him by his grace that you realize he's calling you to believe, and you, and you don't even really understand all the picture of how that happened. You just know that you're a sinner, and he's a Savior, and someone has shared with you that you can be saved in Christ, and his spirit, you, you, you just sense something's happening, and so you believe upon Christ, and you follow him in Christ. Well, at that moment, when you first get saved, you have no idea what really happened most of the time. You've heard that there's a Savior and that you're a sinner and that you can be rejoicing in that. There's many who have said, well, it was like a great weight was lifted off of my shoulders when I finally came to Christ. I've heard that testimony in Africa. I've heard it in Asia. I've heard it in America. I've heard it in South America. It's very interesting. People who have never been around Christians before, when they pray to receive Christ, very often they sense a weight being lifted off of them. It's, a, it's this beautiful picture. I'm not getting weird or anything like that, but it's just this beautiful picture of not fully understanding what all had happened, but sensing something grand has happened. Well, as we continue forward, we start to see the cross more clearly. For a Christian that is growing and maturing, he starts to see that the cross is getting bigger and bigger. You see, the reality is I'm starting to realize what all he saved me from. I'm starting to realize how, how scandalous it was that he came and died in my place. It's almost impossible for someone when they first come to faith in Christ to see the gospel in all of its perspective. But when we study sin and when we study the wrath of God, suddenly the cross gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I want you to recognize that as we take a little bit of time here and there to look and see 
the passages that describe Israel's sin. And as we take time to look at our own sin, that we come to deal rightly with God. The fact of the matter is, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, came and died on the cross for our sins. The greatest scandal of all, that he would come and buy us out of our sin, that we may come to know and to live in him. If you have never received by faith the glorious salvation that God offers to you in the grace of Christ, I call you. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, as many as received him, to do those who came to realize that he is the Savior, who believed in his name, they have the right to become children of God, those who believe in his name. I call you to the great gospel of Christ. Would you stand with me for prayer?